Good evening, everybody, and welcome to all our attendees and our special guest speakers. And um, today's been quite an auspicious day for us. We've uh, got some very important speakers for us this evening, which I'm going to introduce in a second. But also, we had the Countess of Wessex visit our service today. So we've had rather a special day already. So it, long does it continue today? So we're very excited about today. Thank you very much for all attending. Today, tonight, we have Sir James Waits, CBE, Chairman of the Waits Group. Steve Ingham, CEO of Page Group, with his own very personal story. Mary Doyle, executive coach and disability and equality trainer for Rocket Girl Coaching. And finally, and not least, is our very own Graham Race MBE, um, who's QES Head of Accessible Aviation. I'm just going to take you through a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce the first speaker. Please um, put your Zoom in speaker view to get the very best out of this evening's event. Um, you can do this by clicking speaker view in the right top hand corner of your screen. The event is recorded, so don't worry if you miss anything or the doorbell goes. Um, we'll share the recording with you later. Um, we ask please though to use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to raise any questions. We'll take some of those later. We hope you enjoy the event and I'm going to hand over firstly to our first lead guest speaker, former QEF trustee on the Edward Guinness Appeal Board, long-standing QEF supporter and chairman of the Waits Group, Sir James Waits CBE. Thank you, Karen. And good evening, everyone. Under normal circumstances, I'd say how pleased I am to see so many of you here this evening. Obviously, with this being virtual, it's slightly different. I was delighted when QEF asked me to participate in, in this event. I've known about QEF's great work for over 20 years. And as Karen said, I was a trustee from 2005 to 2017. And I'm really pleased to continue to support them. I'll tell you more later about how you can get involved. Quite simply, the QEF transforms lives by empowering people with disabilities, not just so they can live so-called normal lives, but so they can unleash their true potential. And I'm pleased to support their great work. As I see it, the core of QEF's work is supporting people to deal with adversity. On QEF's website is a video with some stories of people who have seen real adversity. With the support of QEF, they were able to respond to adversity with real fortitude and flair. They can tell their stories much more eloquently than I can. So I recommend you have a watch. I know that Steve Ingham will have a thing or two to say about how he has responded to adversity. There are a lot of cliches about adversity, that it is a gift, that it builds character, that what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. To paraphrase Rudyard Kipling, if you can watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools, ultimately yours is the earth and everything that's in it. Words are easy, I suppose. It's important that we have a real hard look at how we, as business leaders, build the right conditions that allow people to turn adversity into a strength. Here's a short example of dealing with adversity. Many of you will have heard of Will Bailey. He was known to us at Waits long before he became a contestant on Strictly Come Dancing a couple of years ago. He's a two-time Paralympic medal winner in table tennis. First, a silver in London in 2012, then a gold in Rio in 2016. And since 2018, I'm pleased to say that the Waits Group have been sponsoring him. Will gets involved in some of our staff's charity fundraising efforts and our community outreach. He speaks with our staff and children in local schools around the country. He's a crowd favorite and a great motivator. I'm going to have a conversation with him next week. And frankly, I can't wait. Through the years, he has bounced back from numerous setbacks. He was born with a genetic disorder affecting all joints. And he had cancer at the age of seven. In 2019, he withdrew from Strictly after injuring his knee during a rehearsal. This also set him back in his training to defend his Paralympic gold medal in Tokyo but he's bouncing back. He is driven, some would say obsessed with his training. And he's, he is on the edge of greatness. We certainly hope so. He is a tremendous example of someone who not just responds to adversity, but seems to thrive on it. 
Many of us as individuals and organizations are bouncing back from the pandemic. Coronavirus and the restrictions that it required were an adversity many of us were ill-prepared for. So the challenges of adversity and how we respond to it is very much the context of what I want to talk about. In the next 15 minutes or so, I want to share with you our experience at the Weights Group. We are trying to build a more inclusive company, which in turn can help us become more diverse, especially in terms of people with, with disabilities, which can then help us to be a smarter, stronger company. I'll talk you through how we're doing that, and I'll say a bit about how we're supporting those with disabilities that may not be visible, such as mental health issues. For us at Waits, the pandemic was the most challenging time in our company's 124 year history. And we've been through two world wars and numerous economic crises. So we've seen adversity before in a business context. The pandemic came on top of several recent shocks to the construction sector, Brexit, the collapse of Carillion and the Grenfell tragedy. As a sector, we've been plagued by quality issues, low margins and inefficiencies in the way we work. In the past few decades, we've had report after report showing that construction is marred in old-fashioned ways of thinking and working. The construction lacks a collaborative ethos, but it is not inclusive. Looking at our own company, we could not deny that we too need to change. Not surprisingly, a root cause of the construction sector's outdated mindset is a lack of diversity. I won't belabor the point because I'm sure most people here know very well that a more diverse workforce is good for business. What do we mean by diversity? Of course, it's about gender, ethnicity, sexual identity, disability, and other characteristics. But more importantly, it's about diversity of perspectives, different ways of seeing the world. This means diversity can make for constructive questioning and better decision-making. It can make for creativity and work environments that foster innovation. Quite simply, it makes for smarter working. Here's another very practical argument for diversity. The construction sector is losing the war for talent. We struggle to recruit the best and the brightest, especially following Brexit. We are suffering big shortages of skilled workers. Frankly, this is our own fault. We in construction have not made ourselves an attractive career option for women, ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, and others. A lack of diversity combined with an out-of-date mindset means that the industry is at a disadvantage when it comes to attracting new talent. Take disability, for example. About 20% of working age, at working age adults in the UK have a disability, but in construction, people with disabilities make up only about 9% of our workforce. In the UK, less than 15% of construction workers are women. Less than 4% of construction managers are from ethnic minorities. No wonder we have skill shortages if we alienate most of the population. Construction has an image problem, and this is harming recruitment. We must change. At the Wage Group, we're trying to do our part. We're trying to create a truly inclusive work environment. So people from all backgrounds and abilities will come to us, and more importantly, stay. Our diversity and inclusion strategy that we introduced two years ago has challenging targets for recruiting and retaining a more diverse, work, diverse workforce by 2025. But it's more than targets. Crucially, our CEO, David Allen, has really embraced the strategy, in particular through his personal commitment to being anti-racist. It's not enough for an individual to be free from prejudice. Everyone has to be prepared to challenge other people's prejudice. And David is showing very prominent leadership in that regard. Our strategy is about positively creating an inclusive culture. That's, that starts by telling a business, by being a business, where everyone is welcomed, included, and connected. A business where we look out for each other. A safe place in which everyone can be themselves. We want to be a business where everyone is treated fairly and gets the chance to contribute and progress. Where new ideas are encouraged. Where the health and happiness of our people is explicitly prioritized where performance is recognized and differences are celebrated. What does that mean practically? Well, we have recently introduced a set of flexible working principles to help staff and their managers discuss and agree on working patterns that are right for everyone. These principles are not a set of boxes to tick. They recognize that every case is different. 
And there are potentially great benefits for improving well-being, meeting clients' needs, and of course, being more inclusive. We've set up reverse mentoring schemes where more junior staff mentor our senior executives to help them understand what it's really like to be someone with a disability or any number of other perspectives. We're looking carefully at job advertisements and recruitment practices to make sure they're not unwittingly excluding people. We've been renovating our office in Leatherhead to respond to the new post-COVID realities. And in doing so, we've created more diverse collaborative workspaces so that everyone, whatever their abilities, could make the best use of the office environment. Going forward, we know we need to improve our communications. This includes featuring more disabled people in the images we use in our marketing materials. We need to include stories with people about disabilities in our internal and external communications, celebrate their successes, and make sure people with disabilities can literally fix themselves in construction. We need explicitly to welcome people with disabilities into our company through our recruitment adverts and to make sure the platforms on which we post vacancies are easily accessible to those with sensory disabilities. Once we welcome disabled colleagues to the business, we need to ask how we can, can continue to support them so they'll stay with us and thrive. Consider that adjustments for people with disabilities might also be beneficial for everyone and make for a generally more productive work environment. We've set up listening groups to share ideas and collaborate. This includes one specifically about disability, led by one of our managing directors, David Morgan. David has long been a driver of our partnership with Will Bailey. That partnership is not just about sponsorship. Will has participated in our disability listening group. It's been inspirational for many in Waits to hear, to hear his personal story. The Disability Listening Group is a forum to hear from other people with disabilities in the company, especially those whose disabilities are not visible. They have faced and overcome significant adversities. It's really important to hear their stories. We're learning that we didn't know what we didn't know. Indeed, many disabilities are invisible. Are invisible. Worryingly, one survey showed that 58% of workers with disabilities feared they would lose their jobs if their disability became known. So there's a good chance that even if someone had a disability that isn't, that isn't immediately visible, they may feel a need to keep their disability hidden. This is a shame, and it must be a terrible burden on those people. We at Waits are acutely aware of the pressures all of our people are under, and mental health issues are a huge concern. Mental health issues should be respected and people supported just with any disability. Mental health issues are particularly serious in the construction sector, where our can-do culture, in many ways it's still a macho culture, means that many staff are not willing to share feelings or ask for help. In the UK, suicide claims the life of one construction worker every day. That's three times the national average. We're proactively trying to shift the culture. Mental health issues are prominent in our internal communications. During the lockdown, we ran a look after yourself campaign to encourage people to do things like talk it over. We also what we, have, what, we have what we call mental health first aiders around the company. We have more, hundred, more than 250 of these mental health first aiders now, including one at nearly every construction site. We're not trying to do this all by ourselves. We have a partnership with the National Suicide Prevention Organization, Papyrus. I'm pleased to see others in our sector tackle the mental health challenges, the trade press, professional bodies like the Chartered Institute of Building, and others. In our sector, we've always been focused on the resilience of structures and systems. Now, we are talking of mental resilience as well. The pandemic has brought mental health issues front and center. In this environment, bouncing back mentally is tough. Again, I'll refer to Kipling's poem, If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. At the end of the day, yours is the earth and all that's in it. It's important that as an employer, we are supporting our people. So even if all others about us are losing their heads, we don't as well. 
It takes a lot of work to be actively inclusive, but we're certain that the truly inclusive workspace is not just the right thing to do, but has business benefits as well. We're confident that being inclusive will help us appeal to people who would never have previously been able to picture themselves in a construction career. So we can really appeal to the best and the brightest. We still have a lot to learn. The Waits Company has been in business for 124 years, and I'm in the fourth generation of family ownership. We've always been guided by the belief that good business done well is a force for good in society. But we're continually learning about how to make that happen in practice. Now, creating a company environment that embraces diversity and is truly inclusive is our challenge. I hope it's been helpful for you to hear a bit about how we're doing that at Waits. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions later. Karen, back to you. Thank you, Sir James. Um, I hope everybody found that as motivating as I did. Um, I'd, re I'd really now like to introduce to you Steve Ingham, CEO of the Page Group. Welcome, Steve, and we'll welcome to your personal story. Thank you. And uh, follow that. Um, <laughs> I feel somewhat humble that. Uh, I haven't really got any significant initials after my name, uh, except for a BSc in metallurgy, which will uh, perhaps come to uh, purpose when I talk later. And um, it's very late in my career, I needed to have that degree. Um, so a bit of background for, for those of you who don't know, and it's, it's actually quite useful normally when I can see everybody, because uh, as soon as I say, uh, I, I grew up in a business called Michael Page, Page Group, you know, you get people tapping on, on the next person's shoulder and go, you know, they rejected me um, or something, which of course we have to do numerous times. Um, I'm sorry if, if we did. Um, I'm sure you were very good, it was our mistake. Um, so uh, my career, um, somewhat unusually, I've been 35 years in the same company. Um, I joined Page when it was about 240 people um, in, three countries, although that's exaggerating it probably, largely one country, recruiting accountants, uh, mostly in the city. We changed uh, literally uh, beyond belief since then. We're now 7,000 people. We're in 37 geographies. Uh, our biggest market is actually France, would you believe? Uh, being competitive, that doesn't always sit well, but um, France is bigger than the UK. And uh, I suspect in the next, 18 months, Germany, the US or China will overtake France. So, we're, you know, we're really changing in terms of shape. 90% um, of our business now comes from outside of the UK, whereas it was the reverse when I, when I joined. Um, I've been very fortunate um, at Page to become the CEO. Um, I did that 15 years ago, having been on the board for five years before that. So, uh, in terms of surviving as a CEO, that's uh, 15 years in a FTSE 250 business isn't bad. Uh, a lot of CEOs seem to only manage three or four as an average. Um, so uh, I'm pleased to have taken Page through so much change and uh, we're now a very significant business. And uh, our purpose is to change people's lives. And of course, that includes our own people um, the 7,000 that work for us, who we've moved around the world, we've done everything organically, never acquired a business. Uh, so we've planted our best people in different markets around those 37 countries and grown significant businesses. We've changed the lives of many candidates, we believe, hopefully the, for the better, helping them build successful careers. And we've changed the lives of clients as well, where we've helped them find the right people to, to uh, project their business. Um, and also sometimes strategically. So we've built large parts of their business they didn't otherwise have, like shared service centers in Kuala Lumpur or in Sao Paulo, um, and equally as well on diversity, which I'm glad Sir James will now have to take my uh, business development call when I tell him that we're focused on helping clients improve their diversity as well. Um, and uh, interestingly, I've just uh, we've just recruited somebody in a wheelchair to 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 head that division. It won't be just focused on disability, but uh, I think uh, it'll be believable that he's talking with authenticity when he uh, when he meets clients and so on. Uh, it's it's on a lot of people's agenda. Um, 
contrary possibly to the to the belief uh, that the culture in recruitment is perhaps closer to dare I say at the Wolf of Wall Street than, than uh, perhaps where it actually is. Um, we as a business are very much focused on diversity and inclusion. That's something I put on the agenda when I first became CEO. Um, I'm pleased to say we have 55% women and 45% and men. We don't replicate that ratio all the way up the business. And that's something that we've uh, we're very focused on changing. It's improving, but it's not improving fast enough. So we're looking at very creative ways of making that happen faster. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very focused on the other areas as well, uh, including disability. Um, so James mentioned adversity there. Um, there's no doubt about it. Uh, like him, I've been through a lot of adversity as a CEO. Um, the thing about recruitment is it's very cyclical, as you can imagine. Um, and that is when economies are suffering, we suffer. People don't move jobs and certainly companies don't want to hire people. Invariably, they're doing the reverse. And so uh, you can imagine in the middle of the GFC in 2009, 20% uh, of our business was with banks. Well, they were throwing people out of banks, not hiring them into banks. So uh, you can imagine it was a pretty torrid time. Um, and of course, in individual markets, it's been very tough, such as Hong Kong recently, in Chile, Santiago recently. It's been very difficult. Um, and I've seen that many times, and of course, in the last 12 months. And again, just put your head around what, what we do. We put candidates and clients together face to face for interviews, don't we? And yet, uh, clearly, that wasn't happening last year and still isn't happening in many geographies. So we're transacting business from the very junior to the very senior at CEO level, where literally uh, there hasn't been a face-to-face -face meeting. So how we have moved and changed. Now, specifically, I've been asked to talk around uh, disability. And I, I guess there's a, a personal story and then a professional one. Um, the personal one, uh, two years ago, I did something that uh, a lot of people do, and that's when skiing. Um, and I had an accident. I, I ski all the time, um, every year. I thought I was a good skier, but clearly I'm not. Um, and I was skiing somewhere that I was very, very familiar with uh, as well, in Bangen in Switzerland. Um, I was on my own, which is the first time I've done that, um, stupidly, and obviously I regret it now. Um, my fiance was taking a lesson because she's relatively new to it, uh, and I said I'd see her at lunchtime, and, um, well, I, I didn't make that lunch, that's for sure. Um, I made a bad decision uh, when I was going down a fast piece of run. Uh, it was a very poor day. The lifts weren't working, so I was relying on the trains. Um, and I decided to put an extra turning because I was going a little fast as I approached a bridge. It's quite a narrow bridge, the width of a car. And um, so I missed the bridge and basically went into what the bridge was there for, um, which was basically to go over a river. Um, so I disappeared down about 15 feet um, into a river um, and uh, I can tell you now it was very cold, <laughs> but um, it, straight away, I, mean, I remember actually as a, as a long term rugby player playing till I was 40, I remember thinking don't be unconscious because that will be game over um, and I also remember thinking this is going to hurt <laughs> and it did. Um, so, you know, I cleared the snow out of my ears and realized that um, I was very cold, except my legs weren't. Um, so straight away, even with my limited uh, knowledge of health um, and, and the medical world, I, I realized I was paralyzed and um, I couldn't move my feet anyway. They were uphill and they were obviously one of them had a ski still on and certainly had my boots on. So uh, it would have been impossible. Um, I could see the the predicament I was in nobody had seen me go in there so uh, first of all I had to get found um, I knew as a as a Cornishman that hypothermia was going to set in very quickly if I uh, didn't get out of there uh, obviously I checked my phone uh, if anyone's thinking logically that's uh, the first thing you do of course I did it didn't work because I was in a gully uh, so there was no signal so uh, that was uh, quite a quite a difficult situation um, I also had another problem, which I, I didn't realize at the time, but it probably explains the pain I was in. Um, I'd smashed most of my ribs, but also 
back and front, which means you've got a flailed lung. But what was really annoying, I guess, uh, for the thoracic surgeons afterwards was bits of ribs shot into my lungs. And, and therefore I was, if the, if, the, if the hypothermia didn't get me, then I was gonna drown um, in my own blood. So I had a liter and a half of blood in my lungs as well. So difficult situation. Um, it was certainly required a bit like in the middle of a pandemic, um, you know, don't panic. <laughs> Clear thinking does not come at a point where you're panicking. Um, and so think your way out of this somehow. Shout, of course, but, but as you can imagine, my lungs were getting weaker and I was generally, so I was getting quieter, I realized that. I needed to do more. And unfortunately, that the only way I could think of because I was quite a long way down, was to attract attention by doing something unusual. Um, so, uh, but that meant taking items of clothing off, um, like my gloves. And, you know, this just made me colder, as you can imagine. I and mean, I was wet anyway, so I sort of thought, what the hell, and, and took my gloves off and threw them with some supposed accuracy onto the bridge or close by. Nobody spotted that, so that was no good. Um, and in fact, strangely, um, there was that moment in time where, and again, if anyone's been faced with this, you'll know you've got this consuming desire to go to sleep, which I realized was the hypothermia uh, setting in. And you know that that's a one way, one way road. You go to sleep, you don't wake up. And um, so I, I de with determination, carried on. And I actually threw my ski poles, which, uh, trust me, if you can just imagine the picture, it's quite a difficult thing to throw up and onto the slope, but uh, it was that uh, that was spotted by a Frenchman. Uh, so another reason to love France. And, and um, so uh, a Frenchman came to my aid and uh, fortunately um, I, he said, are you in trouble? Which I thought was a funny question at the time. And um, he, I said, yes, I am and don't leave because I need to see somebody because if you leave for 10 minutes, I probably won't be around. Um, so he realized the seriousness of nature and, and the rest is sort of history. I mean, I, I, uh, helicopter arrived. I remember that. That was the last thing I, I remember before I fell into a coma, uh, for quite a long time and, uh, and woke up in, in, in the hospital in Bern, uh, in Switzerland. So, um, yeah, they managed to get me out, obviously. Uh, yes, I did have hypothermia. It took them. 24 hours to get my temperature back up um, and several operations. They clearly had to drain my lungs, patch me up there. They were lucky. I was lucky they put, uh, coming back to metal here, um, they put quite a bit of metal onto my ribs, which is unusual, but it, it would give me more opportunity to focus on the physio I would have to do on my back. And then, of course, they put a load of titanium on my back as well. Um, rods about that long uh, either side of my spine with lots of two inch screws, basically, it seems to me, looking at the x-rays. Um, uh, look, I woke up though. I mean, the only really sad part of all of this is that um, uh, I had to put my children through a lot, which uh, I don't like, it upsets me now. But, you know, seeing your old man on a life support machine is not great. Um, scaring your children is not what about being a parent is about. Um, but I did that day and, uh, well, and for several days afterwards, I think, and uh, because I was in this coma and they were told he may not wake up the same as he was before, um, as in mentally, because they, they thought I might have a brain injury. I damaged my helmet as well, apparently. Uh, fortunately, the only repercussion of that was that I'd lost the hearing in one ear. So that's the year I, I listen to my fiance when she tells me not to drink too much or, or, or to get home early. Um, and I pretend I've heard. Um, so uh, I head off. But um, uh, look, I fortunately woke up from the coma in, in reasonable shape. Um, I knew straight away that I was paralyzed, I could remember. And so I asked lots of tricky questions to trick the doctors into just telling me I won't, I won't walk again. So the if anyone is technically qualified in this particular area, I'm T10, T11 complete, which means my cord is completely severed. Um, and which means I won't be one of these miracles that suddenly gets up and walks and, and shocks everybody. Um, that isn't gonna happen unless science moves a long, long way from where it is at the moment, sadly. Um, so uh, I've had to deal with that adversity. That's clearly uh, gave me three and a half months in, in the hospital. 
Um, uh, so I flew back and, and as soon as I could to at least be able to see other family members and so on and start my rehab, um, which was pretty intense, four hours of physio. I, I took the reins back of the company uh, during that period. I had my own room so I could badger people. Um, and it, it demonstrated to me how leadership had changed. Um, because I, I, I believed I pro probably like a lot of business leaders that as a leader, you know, you're that powerful figure that everybody looks up to. And, uh, you know, it's six foot four and rugby playing and pretty fit. Uh, you know, I ran to work most days and um, I ran in sponsored events, you know, on the Great Wall of China or Centennial Park or Central Park or whatever with my colleagues. I mean, and if I went to a city I hadn't been to before, then I would say to them, great, I'll see you at 6.30 and we'd go for a run and, you know, give me a good way of quickly seeing the city. Um, so they knew me like that. And uh, I, I, of course, with my longevity in the career, I got a lot of messages saying, look, you know, they'd seen the uh, announcement to the city saying uh, Steve's had a tough accident. He's, he's now in hospital recuperating. They were sending messages like, here, yeah, we'll see you again in Centennial Park. We'll go running again in that JP Morgan run or whatever. And I thought, oh, they really don't realize <laughs> this is this is more serious than that. So um, uh, I decided to record a message um, to all of them um, to show my vulnerability, I guess, because I was in a hospital. I managed to put a shirt on like this uh, through a lot of pain uh, at about four in the morning because I was awake because I couldn't sleep. Uh, with the pain and um, I recorded a message which uh, you know we put it on our internal social media Yammer and um, you know very much talked about what had happened I talked through the accident I talked through what I was going to do I was going to talk through the fact that I was in a wheelchair how I frightened my children and, and show my vulnerability of course that gave me 7,000 emails to answer and whatsapp messages and every, everything else as you can imagine so I somewhat thought oh. Um, I'm creating more work for myself rather than putting people in the picture. But the quality of the response or the things that they were saying were unbelievable. I mean, you know, they were coming out with a lot of things, a lot of challenges that they're personally dealing with. They talked about how they showed the video to their, they're not meant to, but they showed it to their children and their husbands or their wives or whatever, you know, to, to perhaps show how one person was trying to deal with adversity. and. Um, that motivated me a lot, to be honest. Um, so re really powerful experience. And, uh, you know, one, when I'm looking at the positives, one, one that uh, I really am proud to have gone through and, and really pleased with as well. So that's, that's the personal story. Um, I, I said I'd talk about metal for a moment. It, it doesn't stop there, of course. You carry on going through adversity with, uh, with disability and challenges and so on. Um, to give you an example, I, I realized just as, when we were in the first lockdown, um, all that beautiful sunshine and so on, um, I realized I was in much more pain than usual. Um, the pain doesn't really go away. Um, and I thought, well, this can't be right. Um, so and I, I contacted a, a surgeon um, here that I built up a relationship with and uh, I said, look, Adrian, this can't be right. And he said, well, you need an x-ray. Well, trust me, an x-ray <laughs> in uh, lockdown is a joke. Uh, but anyway, I managed to eventually, but ringing up, you know, Stanmore, I was assigned to, I rang them up. They said, you know, not coming here, uh, which was reassuring. Um, but anyway, uh, I got an x-ray and then of course I had to have an MRI and, you know, eventually I managed to do all of those things. So I sent them to Adrian and said, um, okay, so what's the story? And of course, in that delightful, surgeon directness he went oh you bust both both your rods uh ah well, what does that mean he said well it means don't make any sudden movements because they could just pop out through the skin at which i think my fiance said well if they do i'll be horizontal on the floor uh because that would be that would be quite horrific uh so um you know i i basically said well great when are you going to operate could it be monday and of course he said i'm not allowed to operate at the moment so uh, all a bit worrying uh, anyway, cutting a long story short, he did. It was another eight delightful days in 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 a hospital with a mask on and obviously not seeing anyone um, and uh, a lot of recovery again afterwards. Afterwards, so uh, onwards. Um, but what it did do was it exposed me to disability, um, and I wouldn't 
I wouldn't say that I was an expert before. I definitely wasn't. Um, we have done a lot in PAGE. I mentioned before about gender. We've done a lot actually in ability at PAGE as well. Um, we have a lot of young people in our business and uh, we, we understood, you know, it was bound to be a case that we would be having a lot of people with mental health issues. It's a high performance business. This was going to happen. And so we probably focused on that element, actually, of disability uh, rather than physical uh, disability. And a lot of powerful stories from people who are prepared to come out and talk about it, have been with the business 10 years and so on. Um, and people I didn't know about. And uh, it was really, really powerful. And I think there's an important lesson here. Leaders have to be authentic. To be authentic, you have to be open about your own vulnerability. And, and sadly, the, the proportion of CEOs and leaders that declare a disability are remarkably low. So that means, I suspect, that there's a lot more out there than they're prepared to admit to. But they won't admit to it because they're worried about their career longevity or how they will be perceived or, or whatever. Um, how can you possibly expect your staff to feel included if you're hiding something that they also are dealing with. So I just, I think there has to be a balance here and there's an important message. It takes courage, I guess. I couldn't hide it. Um, you know, I'm in a wheelchair, so it's a bit of a giveaway, although I suppose not, not at the moment uh, in these virtual world. Um, but, uh, you know, I clearly have to be open about it. I, I met some incredible people, far more incredible and courageous than I've ever been. Um, during that period in hospital. And of course, since then, I've started to try to speak out about disability. And each time I do that, my network just goes boom. And, and I've learned so much about the other categories of dis disability. And what I've learned is really quite shocking. Um, you know, uh, to be frank, Sir James has covered most of the, most of the statistics that I need to, because otherwise we're just talking numbers all night. But you know, when 80%, 82%, frankly, of, of able-bodied people are working um, and only 50% of disabled, it's just wrong. And then, of course, there's a, a significant pay gap for those that are disabled versus those that are able for doing the same job and the same performance. Again, that's just wrong in the same way it is with gender. You know, there shouldn't be a pay gap there either. So, you know, these are things that have to be um, eradicated. So um, I've taken it upon myself, um, partly because I'm in PAGE and we can do something about it within our own organization, the 7,000 people that we've got. Um, but also uh, we've taken it upon ourselves as a corporate to, to, to go out there and try to advise companies uh, to improve their diversity specifically. And in some countries it differs. So in Brazil, for example, we have a whole division that only recruits disabled people into companies because they have a quota system in Brazil, uh, for those of you who don't know, based on the number of employees you've got. So literally we've just, for example, picked up a very large assignment with Vale, who are one of the biggest mining companies in the world uh, to recruit 50, I think it is, disabled people. Um, so, you know, different, different countries will come at it at different, uh, different angles, but this is absolutely key. So what was causing this problem? Um, I think it's numerous, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but we can overcome them all, hopefully. The, most of them are negative reasons that people have about disability, um, mostly unfounded, um, but they all, they all instantly think awkward, expensive. Um, they'll probably always be ill. They'll be off. They won't work as hard. Um, they'll probably leave anyway. Um, you know, all, all of these different things. Um, which is the wrong way of looking at it. And I'll come back to perhaps how I see um, a lot of therefore unconscious bias. You know, naturally somebody in a wheelchair, for example, isn't as strong and as powerful. You know, isn't somebody who can make clear decisions and so on. Again, missing the point, I think, a lot um, in terms of what we look for. Also fear. You know, a lot of people are nervous. I don't want to say the wrong thing. It's similar in race with race. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to offend. I don't, certainly don't want to get in trouble by saying the wrong thing. Um, so again, there's a lot of 
education needed around disability to just mystify what's a, what's a, uh, a mystified subject for many. There's another issue and that is that candidates themselves, so those with disabilities, feel nervous about applying for jobs. And I get it. Do you know that 30%, just over 30% of disabled students, so people who've got a degree, are advised not to declare their disability when they apply for a job because they're told it will disadvantage them. Well, there's a good confidence builder, hey? I mean, you know, just incredible. Again, looking at it the wrong way. And then, of course, there are other issues, um, which Sir James, I'm sure, is familiar with. One is property, uh, and that is, it's great to get a job, but if you can't live near the job, you've got a problem. And my own experience of coming out of hospital when I was doing a, a building res a renovation here, which of course took rather a big twist when I had my accident, um, meant that my house wasn't ready for me to move in. I was still waiting for planning permission to put a lift in. Um, but it meant I had to find a flat. I mean, you, London's a pretty big place, especially to a Cornishman. But when you're trying to find a flat that's accessible, even with T10, T11, which to, to the un unknowledgeable is, is uh, basically just below the belly button. So I'm, you know, I'm perfectly um, capable here. Um, I just need a shower I can that's wide enough to get into that hasn't got a step so that I can get back out again. Otherwise I'm in there for, <laughs> for the long haul. Um, you know, or steps up into the front door of the building or, you know, steps. I mean, I was renting a flat at the time. It was on the third floor with no lift. <laughs> So clearly that wasn't going to work. It was really, really, really difficult. And I, and I only needed six months. I was happy to pay for 12. I was comfortable paying a reasonable amount of money. But could I find one? And it, it was, I was very, very lucky that somebody who used to work for me years ago, who I've, I've mentored over the last 30 years of his career, um, moved out. Uh, him and his husband moved out of, of the uh, flat he was in and uh well he owns and uh he let me stay there for six months with my fiance um because it was accessible and he he rented a flat downstairs in the cellar while i went up to his lovely flat with the balcony um bless him so uh you know a fantastic a fantastic things were done but that's a real issue and i've seen people turn down jobs because they got the job and their offices were accessible but they couldn't find accessible accommodation um, and then finally, of course, travel. I mean, you know, how many how many tube stations do you think can deal with a wheelchair? Um, you know, I think there are a few. Um, so uh, we all have to avoid them. So it, it is tricky. Um, and these things need to be overcome, some of them. But some of them are easy to overcome. Um, you know, about 20, 25% of leaders have heard of back to work as a scheme, a government supported scheme. I mean, it's it's actually, you know, even for the cynical like myself, it's an incredibly efficient scheme. Um, you know, in that I, you know, somebody came to see me almost straight away after I got back to work. What do you need, Steve, now that you're in a wheelchair? I told them, they assessed it and they paid for it. Uh, they didn't need to, but they did. And uh, having paid plenty of tax in the past, I thought, why not? So, you know, the, anything that was an obstacle and things that I could tell them about, they, they were prepared to help me overcome. Um, so I've got a standing machine that I can climb up into. It means I'm standing, which helps my blood pressure and everything else. Um, and actually, this is one that I can drive around, which means that I'm about three inches above the ground and I'm six foot four. So it means I'm the tallest in the office and I scare people to death as I stand these sort of zoom around in this machine around the office, partly because it looks so unstable. Um, anyway. So, uh, you know, there are ways of overcoming some of those things. The reality though is, and I could tell you so many, I'm sure that video that Sir James um, mentioned would help as well. I've got to speed up. So um, would, would, would make it clear, but there's been an amazing amount of courage that different people have shown. And, and what people are not realizing is the qualities that people who are disabled bring. You know, um, if, we were, if we're recruiting graduates and 14% of graduates have got a disability, if we're recruiting graduates, what do we look for? They haven't got loads of experience because they're just coming out of university. We look for courage. We look for resilience. We look for people that can overcome challenges. You know, we, we, all of these different things, we look for loyalty, 
passion, um, any, any determination, stamina, trust me, when you've broken your back or many other things, overcoming challenges is absolutely what's demonstrated by that whole category every single day. Not just when you break your rods, but just getting up in the middle in the morning and putting a suit on. If somebody organizes for me to be in an investor call at 7.30 in the morning, I'm getting up at four. You know, so, I mean, I'm pretty efficient with my time. I have had to be a CEO traveling around 37 geographies. I have taken efficiency to another level to do my job. So, you know, the adversity we have to overcome is a given in most cases. Most people in life, we know this, work because they want a purpose. Disabled people are no different. So this is what we've got to do. And I have dealt with it, but I was, you know, 58 when I had my accident, you know? So and my career was, you know, a long way in. And, you know, I'd done a lot of things physically on my legs, I'm lucky guy. Imagine this at 17 or 20, and then dealing with that. Your buddies are going off to university. They're still playing rugby when you can't. You can't even get onto the pitch to watch it. You know, they're having girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever it is, you know, all of those natural things you thought you were gonna do, your plan is just literally smashed. I met one the other day who was gonna go into the armed forces because his dad's in the armed forces, his granddad is. He was at university studying a uh, really useful degree, history. And, uh, you know, he uh, suddenly finds himself having to make completely different career choices. I'm glad to say he's joining us. Uh, he's tetraplegic. He's here, uh, roughly speaking. Um, so, you know, I'm glad to say he's joining us because he's shown incredible courage and adversity. And he's a really smart guy. Uh, and I know he'll do a great job for Paige. So um, to me, uh, Paige is very much about that. Um, the things that James, Sir James talked about um, in terms of the actions they've taken at weight, uh, similar to us, we've created shadow boards. Um, so the executive board that runs the company has a shadow board uh, of people from all sorts of ethnic minorities, sexual orientation, disability, and they give us very, very powerful recommendations to our board because our board, our executive board is not diverse enough. We have those in the regions and all the big countries as well, France. UK and so on. Um, we've done a lot of training, as you can imagine, a lot of that's been digital recently, but uh, a lot of training, mentoring, again, very, very powerful, because it can all help to educate. And I know if we start to improve, and people are open about their disability, more and more we'll educate those that, that don't know much about it. And I think, again, it is one of those sort of chicken and egg things that we've really got to, to move on. Inclusion is simple. I was asked to, to say, you know, what is my interpretation? It, everyone who goes to work should feel that they've got an equal voice, an equal opportunity and enjoy it in the same way. You know, I've loved working as you can possibly tell, and I don't see why everyone else shouldn't. But the last thing you can do is hide something and not be real. It's just not right. I know a little bit about what that's like because when I joined the boarding school, as a very young guy, you know, suddenly I'm 11 years old at a boarding school for 12 weeks and I join in the middle of a year and everyone's going, who's this geezer that's just turned up? And sadly, they found out I had a hair lip, which then became my name, which at the age of 11 was, I can tell you, pretty tough. And nobody speak to me because I couldn't play rugby and I didn't speak French and I didn't speak Latin. And so, you know, that was that. And, and so I was on my own and it was a lonely 12 weeks. And, and yeah. What makes you breaks you or whatever they say but uh, or the other way around um it, it was tough i would hate to think somebody was coming to page who was gay and knew that but couldn't admit it or was disabled and had mental health problems but couldn't be open and share them so that we could support them that's just ludicrous and wrong and has to change so you know we're really going some way to change that i believe um, my vision, which is shared by many now, I'm glad to say, um, for many, it's a vision that perhaps they're not doing enough about, but it, it, hopefully that will change as well. And the Valuable 500, for example, they've just got to their 500 signature of a major corporate 
that actually wants to level the playing field for disability. It includes massive organizations who I'm pleased to say, rather than just being a signatory, are now signing up to very big projects to level that playing field on digital, uh, you know, on, on all areas, products, consumer products and so forth, which is, which is fantastic. Um, I believe in equal opportunities and I believe in equal reward. And then at the end of the day, uh, I would like everybody to be like Arnold. So Arnold is my golden doodle. And I got him through lockdown. So yes, I was one of these people that, you know, went and got their dog from, from lockdown. And he, um, he's daft as a brush, of course, but the reality is he doesn't recognize disability. I'm just the same as everybody else. Uh, he quite likes it because I'm always sitting down so he can leap on my lap, which if you know what a size of a golden doodle is, he almost sends me flying backwards every time he does it. But, you know, wouldn't it be like, wouldn't it be great if we were all just treated equal and given an equal opportunity in life? Arnold thinks I am normal anyway, so that's just great. If everyone else was like it, then we'd be in a much happier place. I'm sorry I've overrun a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I always get the job of following this and it's really tough, particularly after your story and obviously Sir James' story too. I, I think there's a comments coming in now that people are really thrilled by what you've said. Um, I can't imagine your story over the last few years, but thank you for turning it into something positive at least. Um, and if everybody acted the same as weights and the same as page then we probably wouldn't need this session to see this afternoon so with that i think we should say what we're trying to do as well at qef and qef is very much committed to being a disability competent employer and we very much value diversity in, as a, in our workforce our organizational values are one of everyone matters everyone works together and everyone makes a difference they're very important to us and they run through everything we do and it's very embedded in our organisation. As an organisation we are committed to enabling disabled people to be as independent as possible and for some that's a great challenge. We have a young man who came to us with locked in syndrome who this Sunday is planning on walking out of here to go back to Ireland. I can tell you that's a massive gift we've just given. We are a disability confident employer and we aim to reduce barriers for people who are working at QEF whenever we see them. There's always room for improvement though and I think we all accept that everybody, even the, the stories we've heard so far, there's always chance for improvement. However, working alongside companies such as Waits and Page Group, there's real opportunities we can see for us to change and do things differently too. Working alongside people who have a disability is key to developing our training and around disability confidence and our Ask First team. I've just done that. Before I introduce you to our Ask First team, I would like to just share Lauren's story, who was a client at QEF in 2017 for six months. Lauren was disabled following a brain tumour and therefore her special care and rehabilitation, QEF supported Lauren in returning to work. We're going to play her story. Hi, I'm Lauren, I'm 22. I was a client at QEF in 2017 for six months. Um, I was there as a result of a brain tumor which left me with difficulties. Um, and before going to QEF, I worked in a nursery alongside um, being a placement in a school, a college. Um, so I was involved with all of the teams anyway. So physio, OT, speech and language, psychology. Um, and physio helped me with my walking, running, balancing, jumping. And then in terms of going back to work, they helped me with getting up and down from the floor. They helped me being able to lift heavier things in terms of um, lifting the children. 
um, speech and language helped me put my thoughts into sentences. Um, they also helped me engage in conversation and social situations, which I needed to do at work. Um, OT helped me with my processing and my planning skills by looking at recipes, to doing cooking, going shopping, making plans for the week. Um, then Alana, my speech and language therapist, who was also my key worker, came to my work for a meeting to make it clear what was needed and explain anything that I may have forgotten. Um, and she also came to my college placement with me in the infant school. Um, so I'm now back at work, still doing that job. Two years after I left QEF, I started a foundation degree to train to be a play specialist in our hospital, which I have just finished. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> it's amazing being back. The fatigue is still a struggle, although it's nowhere near as bad as it was. But I used OT and have planned my weeks now to try to reduce the fatigue. Well, I think. Shall I pick up from here, Karen? Yes, please. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you there. Um, thank you, Karen. I um, I'm pretty sure I lip reading there. I think you, you've introduced me. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you uh, to Sir James and uh, to Steve uh, for sharing your powerful stories and experiences. And I think to Lauren as well. I think like hearing your story, Steve, just as you said it there, Reminds me so much of uh, the people that we provide support through our care and rehabilitation centre, and you know, seeing Lauren return to work and having that purpose—that's that's that's what it's all about. So, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, rest assured, no football matches or rugby, Steve. Don't worry uh, to miss tonight, and but uh, we'll try and keep to time and and close at seven thirty. But um, Mary Doyle and I are here this evening to provide you with information about the work that we have been doing in partnership with disabled people and Ethos Farm to support businesses drive inclusion through our Ask First Disability Equality and Confidence Training. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Mary. Mary is a disabled person. She is in the 2020 Disability Power 100, a list of the UK's most influential disabled people and she is one of the Daily Mail's 50 Most Fabulous Females. I can't see Mary, but I'd imagine she might be, I don't know, is she awkward. smiling at this point? Yeah, you know. <laughs> this year, uh, Mary is a nominee for the National Diversity Awards uh, Positive Role Model for Disability, and she's a fully trained executive coach and modern classroom certified trainer. She's, now these are her words, uh, she's a proud aviation geek. So I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't have described that, Mary, but these are your words, aren't they? I love, you love all love things geek. aviation. <laughs> And uh, you've worked uh, for 28 years in software and support services for telecoms and banking. Yeah. Hi, everyone, as Graham has alluded, I am Mary Doyle, and I'm now going to introduce my wingman, Mr. Graham Race, MBE. And Graham is the founder of the QEF's Try Before You Fly service for disabled people to try or being in an aircraft cabin before an actual flight. He's also the designer of the Meru seat for disabled children. Uh, which sits in their craft, and he's a member of the Stansted and Heathrow Access Boards. He is also a modern classroom certified trainer, to make sure we're doing it right, and has lived experience of disability with a close family member and is passionate about inclusion. And in keeping with true disability equality training this evening, I'm the trainer as the disabled person, and Graham is narrator and facilitator, and wrangler for me mostly. So we thought we'd, there's no better way to illustrate this training product that, that we've developed to give you a little taste of what the course contains. Um, and this, you know, we'll, we'll get through this. Um, so stay alert, to quote, over the next 15 or 20 minutes, we'll be as quick as we can as we invite your participation. Thanks, Mary. So to get us started, let me provide you with a bit of background to ask first. So prior to the start of the pandemic, Queen Elizabeth Foundation teamed up with Mary Doyle and Richard Church, both disabled people and equality trainers, together with award-winning and learning development consultants, Ethos Farm, 
to develop disability confidence and equality training solutions for the aviation sector. Now you may say, why aviation? Now, I, I know I've got this headset on, for those of you that can see me, I, I, I reassure you I'm not a pilot. I, I don't do anything as important as that. But the reason it's aviation is, as some of you know, um, QEF offer services to disabled customers who are considering a flight, but perhaps lack confidence due to anxieties going through the airport, through security, or more often than not, how they board the aircraft and remain comfortable for the duration of their flight. Our Try Before You Fly service gives disabled people the opportunity to try out aircraft seating and discuss their journey in a mock aircraft cabin before they fly. And as you may know, up until last year, the aviation sector was seeing a huge growth in the number of disabled customers choosing to fly. We realized that we could share the experiences of our service users directly and authentically for the aviation sector to influence the behaviors of airport agents, cabin crew and contractors at all levels of, all, of an organization to support and drive inclusion. And so we developed the Ask First suite of disability equality and confidence training products, which diversify now into sectors beyond aviation. Thank you, Graham. So the Ask First product consists of two components. Firstly, there's an e-learning module which provides a toolkit of competencies for frontline customer facing staff to be confident in providing inclusive service. It's a 40 minute online animated module for learners to take at their own pace uh, using a work based and it uses work based scenarios familiar to those in aviation that can also be customized to other sectors. It is called Ask First because we are inviting staff to ask. So ask the customer what assistance they require to be friendly to treat everyone as an individual, to reassure customers when required, to simplify their message and to tailor their service to the customer's request. Did you notice our little Ask First acronym there? Secondly, Ask First delivers a disability equality course, which is created in line with the UK Disabled People's Movement and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, with the principles of inclusion and securing equality for all. It is designed by disabled people and people with personal lived experience. So that's Graham and I. Uh, uh, these are delivered by disabled, pardon me, experienced disabled trainers, that's me. And there are very participatory, and that's with you online. So our course is CPD accredited and delivered over Zoom. And we use polls, we use chat, videos, and lots of interaction to provide the complete picture of inclusion by understanding it from disabled people's perspective, investigating the barriers that disable and the actions that we can all take. Uh, we aim to create a, a safe space to ask, discuss, reflect and learn, and to, th to think and act inclusively. The action is the most important thing to bring about genuine equality and equity. Our courses are not about making non-disabled people feel guilty or giving people a hard time or making it harder to understand than it actually is. Inclusion is not the responsibility of HR, it is everyone's responsibility at work and beyond the office. We want you to think about disabled people's rights in the same way that we think about other marginalized communities to increase your understanding of the barriers that lead to inequality and the actions you can personally take to create inclusion. So this evening, we want to give you a very short taster of the course content. Um, traditionally, this would be a closed meeting, um, normally with your peer group, and we'd invite you to turn your camera off so it's easier to focus and you're less concerned about uh, your, your, your decor or, uh, or, or, the, or, the, or your background or pets turning up. So in the next 12 minutes, we're going to look at defining disability, identifying barriers, and the inclusive actions and making a plan for being inclusive that you can take. So our advice to you is to please relax. Uh, you're not going to say anything wrong or be put on the spot. Indeed. So let's start by defining what disability is. We appreciate it can be a complex topic and can make people nervous discussing it, as we've heard from our other guests. Uh, we're jumping straight in here. We want to know, how do you feel about talking about disability? So Graham is going to launch one of our online polls. And for those of you on a mobile device, um, the poll may not appear, but don't worry, we'll feedback the results to you. And also please note that all answers are anonymous and there are no wrong responses. So Graham's going to launch that poll and I'll take you through the options. 
So I've launched the poll. Hopefully you can all see on your screen a poll. Some of you using mobile devices, as Mary said, might not be able to access it this time around. I can't see the poll myself, Amy, really, but that might just be me. Uh, Karen, can you see the poll? Okay, just bear with me two seconds, please. Okay. Here we go. Yay for a poll. Yay. Perfect. Okay, so your options are, this is how you feel about talking about disability. Your options are, I'm confident, bring it on. I'm cool, it's pretty straightforward. I'm confused, I feel anxious. And finally, I'm terrified, I'm worried I put my foot in it. So we'll just give you 30 20 seconds. seconds. 20 seconds to respond. So Graham, when we first started talking about disability, I used to see the fear in your face <laughs> before you even said anything, possibly looking for the nearest exit. Uh, yeah, and I, and, I, and I guess like still sometimes, you know, rank the, as, as Steve said, you know, there can be that fear or uh, make sure I choose the right language. You know, there can be, there can be situations where, well, I'm aware of getting things right. Sure, sure. Okay, so thank you. Got, uh, let's give it a couple more minutes, a couple more seconds. So we've got 40 of you that replied. So let me share your results. Perfect. Okay, wow, we've got, a, we've got a good crowd. So we've got 38% are confident, bring it on, uh, followed by 28% I'm cool, it's pretty straightforward. Wow, we're, we're preaching some converted here, Graham. We are. <laughs> so awesome. So, okay. So Mary, I'm going to stop the share. So I'm Mary, going to start what, with what it actually yeah, is. Yeah, what actually is disability? Uh, so many of us have our own thoughts about disability from our own experiences the way that society uses language or the cultures that we were raised in. All of these will have affected, all of these will have affected how we think about disability. Um, so in reality, I'm going to read this slowly, it's quite a long one. It is the effect of the interaction between the person's impairment with barriers in society. So I don't know if you change your slide, Graham. Here we go. So, in simple terms, it is the barriers which disable people, not their condition or impairment. And you, you may be asking, well, who says this? And actually, disabled people say this. So, this was the first definition written by disabled people in 1976 by an organisation called the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, or also known as UPIRIS. So, just looking at that, that definition written back in the 70s, I guess it was commonplace uh, to think of disability in quite narrow terms, um, focusing on the physical, not yet embracing people with sensory, cognitive, long-term and invisible conditions. This understanding of disability pioneered back in the 70s has influenced political, policy and social thinking over the last 40 or so years. It's widely credited with informing the decisions that governments around the world have taken to develop an inclusive society. Let me read out the United Nations definition. It states that persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis. It is the word impairment that is used here to describe the long-term loss, reduction, or difference in a person's sensory, intellectual, or mental health condition. And we develop a better grasp of disability the moment we distinguish disability from the impairment. So disability is something imposed on top of the impairment, regardless of it being sensory, physical, intellectual, cognitive, or a mental health condition. I have an impairment, which I can choose to share or not, but given that the gents have been so brave, I'll just say I'm a wheelchair, I'm a wheelchair user, you can't tell because of the Zoom, and I have cerebral palsy. But as I'm a wheelchair user, it's a wheelchair that is, um, as a wheelchair user, I'll start again, sorry, I have an impairment, but as a wheelchair user, I am disabled by society. So I understand this may be different to what you have learned previously. Um, and this way of seeing disability is called the social model. It allows us to focus on removing and preventing barriers and increasing inclusion. So how do we do it? How do we do that? How do we go about removing them and preventing those barriers? Well, we need to increase our awareness of those barriers and then we can do something about it. It's quite easy to be unaware of them until we ask a disabled person or we experience them for ourselves. 
and they exist in recruitment just as they do in all other sectors, aviation, banking, construction. And there are three main categories. Firstly, physical or environmental barriers. These are um, things like steps, the availability of lifts, accessible bathrooms, door handles and light switches being a certain height, space for uh, wheelchair turning, uh, wayfinding, signage, noise levels and lighting. And in this, we can also include printed and online material uh, regarding its scale, colour and typeface. Um, the availability and functionality of speech text for hearing impaired colleagues or the use of screen readers for visually impaired people. Then there are organisational barriers, the processes and practices of our organisations that may inadvertently inhibit or reduce access. We can think about a decision to use, say, hot desking, great for efficiency, but challenging for colleagues with cognitive or sensory impairments, knowing where the workspace is and having a setup that is suitable. Yeah. And the third barrier is attitudes, our assumptions, negative opinions, prejudices, stereotyping and our own unconscious biases. Research by the Inactus programme at University College London on behalf of Evenbreak, an inclusive recruitment consultancy, found that the top two barriers among 700 disabled people were finding employers that they felt confident to apply to, i.e. they were disability friendly. And the second was a lack of confidence in an employer's recruitment process, including a fear that the process was biased or discriminatory. Neither of those related to physical barriers. It's essential to ask rather than assume people's experiences. The disabled community and people living with long-term health conditions are the experts in their own lives um, and often have the solutions to the problems they are solving every day. Graeme is now going to bring up a list of six barriers on your screen uh, under our poll two. And the question is, which of the following do you see as barriers to recruiting disabled people? So these are a few long sen longer sentences. Firstly, where to find disabled applicants? knowing how to become a more inclusive organisation, creating a culture to encourage discussion and peer-to-peer -peer support, the cost of implementing, pardon me, the cost of implementing accommodations or workplace modifications, knowing, best, knowing how to best support an employee who becomes disabled. Ah, no polls, is that right? Yeah, it's like Aha, no, no, no. Forgive me. Yeah, I can see it, thank you. So which of the following do you see as barriers to recruiting disabled people? So we'll give you 30 to 60 seconds to, yeah, I think you can do multiple choice also on this. And as I said, they're anonymous. So no one's gonna know what, you're, what you chose. This is where you're right, coming in. Cheap. Thank you everybody. Just give that another 10 seconds. Great. Thank you, everyone. Share the results, Graham. Ta da! Thank you. Okay, so the main one is actually got a joint first knowing how to become a more inclusive organization at 59%, and I'm, uh, along with knowing how to best support an employee who becomes disabled. So they're the most um, common requests. Um, the second one is where to find disabled applicants and employees, followed by creating a culture to encourage the discussion and peer-to-peer -peer support. Yes, yeah, so there's some a good uh, diverse answers there, I'd say. So these are the topics that we discuss and address on our Ask First course. Knowing the barriers in your workplace is a massive step forward to recruiting and retaining talent in your workforce. We'd recommend drawing up a simple matrix of your workforce's requirements related to your sector. In recruitment, for example, you'd want to look at all the key activities and barriers in the process, starting with job design, advertising, the interview or assessment of the candidate, and the process of onboarding and retaining staff. On our disability equality course, we'll help you to identify the barriers and you can continue the work with your team to be inclusive. Yeah, we will then look together at inclusive um, responses, the very real things you can do. For example, ensuring that the job design adverts 
and the applications can be accessed in multiple ways, ensuring that the recruitment portal can be accessed with a screen reader, for example, um, displaying disability diversity in your teams on an interview panel, developing uh, the culture where people can bring their full self to work that, we, that was mentioned earlier, and the benefits of setting up an employee group resource group. We want to help you create your own checklist relevant to your organisation and your leadership actions will communicate across your workforce and cascade out to your customers. So to close our short training example, inclusion is a choice and it's a learning process. So our advice is just get started. We won't get it right every time, but we can learn from our experiences and being honest about our experiences really does help build trust. Thanks, Mary. So our Ask First package is an off-the-shelf product that supports staff across all levels of an organisation. Every part of society has a role to play in increasing equality and being fully inclusive. The purpose of our training course is to empower businesses with knowledge, skills and confidence to show or reaffirm why disability equality matters to every one of us and how it benefits us all. Thank you for attending our course snapshot. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and do feel free to ask questions either this evening or after tonight's event. And do contact us at Queen Elizabeth Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. We love questions. Is there one in the chat? Thank you so much, Mary and Graham. Sorry for the apology, but we appear to have come over the uh, technical difficulty of unmuting. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Marissa, who's going to follow up with some questions and answers that have been raised during the process this afternoon, this evening. So over to Marissa. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and thank you to all of our incredible speakers this evening. Absolutely fascinating and truly inspiring. So thank you again. We are a little short on time. And as you can imagine with this amazing panel, we've had a lot of questions. So I'll try and get through as many as we can. And if I may, I'll start with one for Sir James. So the perception might be that working for a building developer in the Waits Group might present challenges to disabled candidates in particular. How does the Waits Group try to overcome these barriers? I mean, it, it, it's a, it is a challenge because obviously the, the nature of our business and our sites is it's all very physical. Um, so I think if one can, the, the key thing is to find the roles that people can carry out um, irrespective of disability. I think obviously there are more roles one can deal with in one's office environment than on a site environment. But nonetheless, there are many roles that I think disabled people can fulfill and carry out in, in our industry. We've just got to find smart ways of doing it. Um, I wouldn't expect you know, bit, bit people to be able to climb ladders, for example, with ma major disabilities. However, you can get people to a workplace in a safe place. And you've just got to really think how you're going to do that. Thank you. I have a question for Steve. So what do you think are the key first steps for a business leader who's looking to ensure people with a disability can join their workforce? Yeah, I mean, the key is to be authentic yourself about disability. Now, not, not many leaders themselves have a disability, but those that have should declare it. Um, from mental health through to, to something perhaps a, a little more obvious. Um, sorry. And um, so that, that, that to me is the logical starting point, but then you've got to talk about your objectives objectives authentically, why it's important to you, why you believe in it, and you've got to make sure that your team is on board with that as well. Um, so they're equally as convincing. Um, I personally, uh, we, we will also set fairly aggressive targets for ourselves on diversity um, because of what I, we perceive as, as the decision makers as, as being important. And so we've set fairly aggressive targets um, I would love to think that we will get everyone on board with that and uh, through the goodness of their hearts, they'll all do it. But we also have linked remuneration and reward to it as well um, so that we can actually basically motivate people who perhaps are less inclined to, to do something about it and change their way of thinking. Um, the starting point as well as some of the gaps that I talked about earlier in terms of people being nervous around the subject. If as a leader you are, 
then you're probably in a position as a leader as well to educate yourself enough to overcome that concern. So, you know, look at the different aspects of what is bothering you and where possibly getting in the way of your unconscious or conscious bias and actually overcome them so that when you're talking authentically about it, you can do so without feelings of concern or whatever, which will show through. Thank you so much. We've had a question for Mary and Graham. So thank you for sharing a snapshot of your training. Could you please share if that training is only available to the airline industry? Um, no, absolutely not. It's, it's uh, I think, partly because of the dynamic, we, uh, the pandemic, that we've um, uh, moved it into other sectors where the kind of key messages of inclusion can be applied. So um, having uh, an e-learning module enables us to reach uh, quite large numbers of staff with um, inclusive uh, messages and training. And our equality course, the taste of which you've just seen, enables us to kind of get those messages across of removing barriers in many different sectors. So, so no, not, not only for aviation. Great, thank you. And we'll, we'll stay with you because the next, kind of, the next question relates. So how long does the training take from sort of beginning to end for so, an organization? Thank you. So the um, the e-learning module is is a forty minute program, and it's uh, for uh, staff to undertake in their own time. The disability equality program is um, over Zoom, and it's in sixty minute sessions with a twenty minute break in between. So it's three hours of contact time, and all that contact time is with um, with people with first hand personal experience of disability. Um, so it's, it's, it's participatory and it's deliverable, say, in the morning or in an afternoon. Great. Thank you. Um, back to Sir James. So you've got really ambitious targets for the weights group. It's fantastic to see. But once you've reached your desired diversity and inclusion quota by 2025, what do you see as the future vision for your workforce? Um, well, I'm going to pinch an analogy that our CEO uses a lot, David Adam. We're climbing mountains. So our first mountain around the, this agenda is to get to the targets we've set for 2025. When we get to the top of that mountain, we'll be looking for the next mountain to climb. So it's where we take people there. And it's where we where we go beyond that. Because I, I think that this is just the first step on a journey to being a much more inclusive and diverse workforce. And really, as I said earlier, nailing the talent that we need to, to get into our business and, in my view, our great industry. Um, there's so much to do and there's so much opportunity to do it. We've just got to grasp it and go beyond what we've, what we've targeted. That sounds really exciting. Thank you, James. Um, over to Steve. Um, so as the page group, we all know one of the world's leading recruitment agencies. How would you advise a company to promote opportunities to candidates with a disability? Yeah, I mean, some of it's very basic um, in, in terms of the advice that you give. It turns out, you know, you look at their uh, website, for example, where they post their jobs and find out it's not accessible to most or a lot of disabled people, particularly sensory, uh, clearly. And, and you know, the, the starting point is that they've got to make sure, as Sir James said earlier, that the language they're using, where they're posting those adverts and so on, are actually going to attract the right level and quality of response. There are plenty of other things as well. Um, somebody pointed it out to me after my accident that still all the pictures that were on the website, particularly when you went into the investor area, and you know the team was there and so on. Of course, there was Steve standing up next to his team of directors and so on. I wasn't even a show. Now that wasn't because I was shy about the fact I'm in a wheelchair. I don't care. But um, we haven't changed them. Well, clearly, if you've got that opportunity. And you should show the successes you've already had, because I'm sure that we've managed to hire more people in a wheelchair since I became a CEO in a wheelchair. Um, not that I would suggest anyone else goes out and does that, but um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, it's 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 credible to say that the chances are Paige feels this way if they're in a in a chair themselves, and, and so. Um, you know, I would advise them to make sure that the visuals they're using and the way that they're describing their company and everything else shows that inclusion. They might want to talk about successes they've had in other areas of diversity, um, you know, and how much progress they've made and, and be factual about it as well. Because as Sir James was talking about there, it's not just about equality and diversity, it's about equity. 
and I know this is all about words and I'm a metallurgist, so I'm hopeless with words generally, but it, it's not about having a person from each box. It's actually making sure it's equitable. In other words, there's an equal amount of, of people in each category to represent society. So it's not good enough to have one person in a wheelchair if, if, if as, as a proportion that's much lower than the rest of society. It should be equitable. And, and so, um, you know, I think it's, it's really important to make sure and equitable, of course, at different management levels. Um, you know, what, what I see happening in some companies is that they, they become good at looking at ways to get round it properly. So, you, you know, you'll look at a, I don't know, a retailer or something and they'll have loads of people in stores that are disabled or working behind tills. And, and then you find out in terms of management where they're at and there's completely different story. And, uh, you know, you've got to make sure you're equitable as well in terms of, of management levels. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And sadly, we, we have run out of time quite quickly for our Q&A, so I apologise, but we would not want to have cut short any of our incredible speakers tonight. I'm sure all of you have enjoyed hearing from them as much as I have. And where we can, we'll come back to you. Those of you who've asked questions we've not been able to answer tonight following the event. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to hand back to Sir James, please. Thanks, Marissa. And thank you again to QEF for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Thank you, of course, to the other speakers, Steve, Graham and Mary. And thank you to all of you who've attended. I really hope you've enjoyed the event and found it insightful. I'm sure you're aware of the adage that nothing is free in this life. So I have a request for you, which is to please support QEF. There are three ways you can do this. Firstly, make a donation yourself or get your company to make a commitment for ongoing support to QEF. I'm pleased there have already been some donations coming in on the back of today's event. Thank you very much to those of you who have already given. Secondly, Talk to QEF people about getting the bespoke Ask First training for your organization's staff. And thirdly, and I hope this is the fun bit, please join me in supporting the upcoming QEF's celebration of the best of British wines. Did you know there are 51 vineyards and 11 wineries just in the South Downs alone? And did you also know the French vineyards are now buying English grapes for their sparkling wines? In this progressive world, that should be a reason to celebrate. This Best of British Wines event will be a fabulous opportunity for you to, fab to sample some great wine, network, and enjoy a beautiful venue. The date has yet to be confirmed, but I do know there will be a range of sponsorship, sponsorship opportunities for companies. And I'm really about, excited about it myself. And more details will be coming your way for this event, which will take place at some point later this year, subject to COVID. Do speak with QF people to find out more information on any of those three options for supporting QF's great work. And of course, we would hope you do all three. Finally, thank you to all QF staff who have done all the hard work to make this event happen, in particular, Marissa and Jen. And with that, all that remains for me is to say thank you and good night. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you, Sir James, for um, a wonderful evening you've hosted and for every speaker, as you say, that your contribution has been amazing. QEF is de determined to make a difference ourselves. We can't do that on our own, and thank you, Sir James, for setting out that ask because we do need more support to enable us to help more people. If I can ask one message today is change one thing tomorrow so we can help the people who have a disability today. Please, if you could want any further information from us, do contact us and we'd be very welcome to help or ask for your support. Thank you so much and have a great evening and have a safe weekend.